the energy we want. We're about to have our first Q&A of Comic Con on Halloween. It's so exciting. All you have to do is give applause and love and make our guests welcome. It's John Rhys Davies! It should be. Is this working? Yes, it okay. is. Jolly good. Hello. How are you all? Johnny, nice to see you. I see you brought a little hammer. <laughs> Very good. Excellent. Little Harley Quinn. So, uh, how nice to see you all. I seem to see a number of faces here that I've seen before. Have you no homes to go to? Very good. Excellent. Excellent. Now, who has some silly questions? No, first of all, let's get something out of the way. One, uh, yes, it is wonderful working with Steven Spielberg. Yes, Peter Jackson is a remarkable genius of a director. Uh, no, I am not going to be able to tell you whether I'm in Indiana Jones 5 or not. Uh, um, what else? Uh, uh, and no, Orly Bloom and I did not hang out a lot together <laughs> when he was 20 and I was 55. <laughs> um, I think that covers the main topic. I think, I think you've done the, all the questions. Oh, Jerry. <laughs> oh, very good. Yeah. Sit, um, sit, sit, sit. You sit, Jerry. Now, how long have you been doing this? Me? I have been doing this, oh, let's think. I got my big break back in the mid 2010s, and you know, just sort of been going from Comic Con to Comic Con, sort of interviewing and things like that. Very, very good. Yeah. You, you trained as a cinema technician, did you not? Oh, I, I have trained in film, yes. Oh. Yeah. I, 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 we actually interviewed me now, are we just? <laughs> well, I'm uh, just interested, actually. Yeah, no, I, um, I mean, if you want to talk, because you love cameras, don't you? And you, you very much understand film, uh, not just as an actor, as an... Uh... I understand more and more about less and less. <laughs> uh, it's one of the characteristics of age, you realize how little you really know and how much you keep forgetting. Anyway, come on, let's <laughs> ask some interesting... These are young, bright, intelligent people. Ask questions. Oh, John wants questions straight from you, then get your hand up and we'll come one, two there straight away. Do not be shy. The, the, the gentleman from me behind. Yeah, we've got microphones coming, they're over here. The, what is the worst location you've been on? Uh, uh, uh. You mean, where did I have more dysentery than the not? Uh, We're not talking about your personal life, John. <laughs> um, well, there, there was Raiders of the Lost Ark when we were in Tunisia, and we all came down with a, with, with a bug that... Uh, I, t I tell you, I lost 22 pounds in two days. That's about... Uh, Nine kilos, I think, in two days. Um, uh, that wasn't good, but um, the worst location. Um, well, there was that place in Kenya where uh, the, the director had a nervous breakdown and we were all billeted in an ex brothel. Um, <laughs> yeah, that was, that was interesting too. But by and large, Come on, you're there for the work. Uh, and sometimes you get great things. I mean, when I did the Bond film, uh, we had a, a three or four week break between Vienna and Tangiers. And so I hired a car and I just did a wonderful tour with a very beautiful woman um, for three and a half weeks. It's hell being an actor. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, awful, awful job, isn't it, John? Um, um, is there anywhere where um, you just... Do you have any bad memories of, of filming, or has it been quite a lovely, just every job's different, and every job's the same? No, I, there are a few bad memories. Um, I hate working on those films where you turn up and everyone is deadly silent. Uh, because you know that someone is throwing a moody fit and it's generally the young actor who has taken too much coke 
and can't focus on what he's doing and his relationships are falling apart and, and he's forgetting his lines and he's forgetting his lines and saying, I can't stand that camera in my face. Get him off the set, get him off the set. I want him fired and this sort of thing, you know. And, yeah, and you know that that's just going to be a moment of total misery. Um, but by and large, that doesn't last very long. Uh, our, our industry is very much about um, making things work rather than stopping things working. Uh, and that's one reason why all of you should work in the film industry for at least six months, especially the younger ones. Because you will learn one great truth. Nobody wants, nobody wants you people around them who say, we can't do this because. What we want are people who find solutions to problems. What we want are the people who say, all right, we'll do that. When the director says to you, we are shooting that way after lunch, and I want two zebra in the background. <laughs> um, don't say, sir, we're in the middle of a Caribbean island, and there are no zebra to be had in 5,000 miles. You say, right, sir, two zebra, background, after lunch. You go out and preferably hire, or if you have to, buy two donkeys and some paint. <laughs> And you paint them, and you put them in the background, and you go up to the director after lunch and say, I uh, got you your zebra in the, in the background, sir. And uh, he'll go, what? Uh, zebra? In the, oh, yeah, yes, it was a stupid idea. Anyway, I'm shooting that way. <laughs> right? That's the film industry for you. Um, but, um, but the point is, in life, do not be the person who points out why things can't be done. Be the person that says, it's difficult, but if we did this, this, and this, we would end up with the same result. Or if we did that and that, then we wouldn't have to do that. Uh, find answers, not difficulties. Sorry, next question. That is some brilliant advice. Um, we've got a question down here. Just wore the microphone. Young lady. Oh, sorry, already there. Hi. Um, if you could play any other character in Lord of the Rings, who would you choose? Galadriel. I think I've got. I found the inner dwarf. I could find the inner elf, couldn't I? I mean, do you not see? No, maybe not. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know. Um, I, I think. I think we want the one of the reasons that you love Lord of the Rings, that we all love Lord of the Rings, is the casting was perfect. Yeah. You know, if it was approximate. When they got the actors together, the actors found the characters, and they become the characters. Some actors have become so strong that you cannot now read the book without seeing the actors. Um, which Tolkien would probably be a little bit annoyed about. <laughs> uh, but, um, but that's what successful directing involves. Casting, if you cast right as a director, probably 80 or 90 percent of your problems are solved. Um, all right, uh, next question. We got any more? Get your hand up. We got some down here. Yes, it's Gandalf the Grey. Oh, there is a. I heard that um, the makeup that it burned on your face, is that true? Uh, the, the question is uh, the, the wretched makeup. Um, there was nothing wrong with the makeup. The adhesive we used was, uh, was, was medical adhesive. Um, medical adhesive is hypoallergenic. It won't give you allergies. But it does really bind to the 
the skin cells on the surface of the skin. It's not designed to be taken off on a daily basis, and it just abrades the skin faster than the skin can grow. So I lost all the skin around my eyes like that. Uh, and I looked hideous. I looked so hideous that my then girlfriend said to me, Honey, I don't know how to say this to you, but I can't bear to look at you. I've got to go back to LA. Yes, it was a lonely time for a lonely war. Ah. Right, uh, we had some down here and yeah, we, over this way, Thomas. Yeah. I, if you can change, if you can change anything in uh, the character in Lost of the Ring, what do you change? Say that again. I, if you could change anything from your character in Lord of the Rings, what would you change? Probably I would have simplified the makeup. <laughs> um, and you'll notice that in uh, in the in Snow White and the Thirteen Dwarfs, I mean, I think I'm the Hobbit. Um, uh, the the, uh, the dwarf makeup was very much simplified, and I, and I have a fantasy about how that happened. You know. The studio execs are saying, okay, now, uh, can we make a trilogy out of this? I mean, there's no point in making just, you know, we want a big urn. We need another Lord of the Rings, but it's a small book, so now. Well, never mind. The small books, you know, can expand them, you can. Right, now. Uh, who's gonna play the lead? Yeah, okay, and uh, right now, who's gonna play the female lead? I mean, could Sigoni, is there a part for Sigoni, or... Uh, there is no female in it, sir. Oh, what do you mean there's no female in it? Oh, well, sir, if you, you remember when you read the book? I read the book? Yes, well, of course I read. I read thousands of scripts, for God's sake, do you think I can remember it in detail? Just tell me who the young female, uh, you know, clickbait, eye bait, Catcher is. They're not in the book, sir. Well, well. All right, well, tell me who the male uh, the hero is going to be. Well, sir, um, there are 13 dwarves, and it's basically about them and the Hobbit. 13 dwarves? You mean we're going to have 13 people looking like John Bloody Reese Davis? That ain't gonna happen! Just find me two handsome young men, minimal makeup, and screw the rest of the dwarves. And get me some women in it! God damn it, writers, what the hell do they know? This chap talking, he'll never work in the studio again. <laughs> I'm sure it went something like that. <laughs> we in the room, Jim. <laughs> it sounded very familiar. You know, you know it as well as I do. That's probably yeah. It's probably exactly what happened. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I went weirdly on the makeup thing of the dwarves. I heard a thing that when they shot the whole thing, they could do it 60 frames per second, like really high res. They had to CGI over a lot of the makeup as well, anyway. Like, it's ridiculous, isn't it? Yes. You're a fan of high, high def, high res, or you prefer the film look? I. Look, I'm a, I'm a fan of anything that helps tell the story, you know. If, if that's what you need for the story, yes, go high tech. But most stories are simpler than that, and we love stories, you know. For 200,000 years, our human ancestors, our, our homo sapiens ancestors, they, they sat round the fire at night. And they looked at the stars. They could see stars more than we ever see because of the, the darkness of the night sky. And the law of it would be, what is up there? And there'd be a lot of it. But you can also bet there was, okay, what are we going to talk about now? And somebody would say, it was a dark night. And slowly there emerged out of the mist this figure. And at that moment, 
the first filmmaker was beginning in our head. We love, we love a story. What happens next? Uh, and a moment later, there's another guy going, I need some more stars to look like this. That's right. <laughs> Have we got any more questions? John, please get your hands up. Do not be shy. We've got one there, one there, one there. So we're going to go there and then we'll come around to you two. Uh, we can't hear the mic. Is that because of the speakers? Um, uh, what's your favorite Ghibli moment or uh, quote? And what's your favorite moment from the films overall? Your favorite Gi uh, Ghibli quote and your favorite moment from the film. My favorite Ghibli quote. <laughs> we, we were trying to, uh, we were doing some jumping in the green screen thing and um, I, I made the jump and I, I swayed backwards like that and instinctively Orlando thought that I was going to fall off the platform. So he grabbed at the beard uh, and I grabbed his hand and said, not the beard! <laughs> Thinking, oh God, I'm going to spend eight hours in makeup if he pulls it off. Anyway, that, that would be one moment. but. Um, my, the, 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 and, but Ghibli's favorite thing in the movie? <laughs> that. <laughs> Liver, I could instantly knew what Jim what you were doing. Great. Absolutely great. Right. We've got one, two more questions down this way, and then if you've got any more, let us know, because we're going to run out of time soon. Oh, just hold it a bit higher, so... Can you hear me? Yeah. People uh, probably ask you all the time, who was the worst person to work with, but who was the nicest? Who was the nicest person to work with? Can you pick a favourite, John? Well, you can't obviously pick favourites, really, but... I have a... I have, I, I, I have wonderful memories of every one of those people on War of the Rings. Wonderful memories. But still, for me, one of the most endearing memories was um, Vigo and I, we were filming in a very remote part. I mean, we were in a remote part of southern uh, New Zealand anyway. And it was basically a three-hour journey to and from a very remote hotel that we had all day. And it was a pleasant evening, and Diego and I were the last two people there. And we thought, well, rather than drive back to the hotel, we'll stay in our trailers. Uh, and of course, there was not there was the security guard and, the, uh, and all that. But there wasn't really a provision for a proper evening meal. So Vigo got his fishing, always carried his fishing rod with him, and caught us two trout. And we had, we had trout cooked over a pan, in a pan over the fire, and uh, and, and spent the evening you know, talking about this and that in the world. A very intelligent, thoughtful, unique individual uh, uh, with a real brain and a real capacity for thinking, you know, originally. He must drive the studio bosses mad because you can't, you can't put him on a tram line and make him do what you want to do because, you know, Vigo could earn his keep as a photographer and has. He's exhibited as a, a, as a photographer internationally. Uh, some of you may have seen that film that he did with Michael Douglas uh, and, uh, and um, oh, everyone's a critic. <laughs> and, oh, uh, Michael Douglas and, and, and the uh, uh, but essentially, he's having an affair with Michael Douglas's wife. He's a young artist, and Michael Douglas uh, induces him to kill the wife. Yeah. Um, oh. Anyway, yeah. someone must. Anyone? Ah. Oh. Anyway, the, 
there's a shot in it of the artist's studio. And all those paintings that you see in there are actually Vigo's paintings. He could earn his keep as, a, uh, as an artist. Wow. Anyway, he's also not a bad poet. Um, so he doesn't have to do what the studio wants him to do. If he sees a script that he really likes, and, uh, and, and he'll do it. Um, but that drives the studios mad, you know. You own these guys, for God's sake. You give them a chance to make a big movie, and what do they do? They don't take the next chance, thus depriving the studio of revenue. This is not good. <laughs> right. A beautiful story about the transfer. I'm just checking the time because I don't, the wrestling will start soon, so we got time for a couple more questions. There was someone behind you, Thomas, and then we'll come to this lady, and then was anyone else before we wrap up? I think we'll wrap up after those two then, yeah. Hi, the scene you dislike the most? I dislike the yeah. most. I, I haven't seen it. <laughs> um, look, it's brilliant. It is a brilliant film. Impossible to make out of a film out of that book, which is why Tolkien sold it so cheaply originally. Uh, it is the genius of Peter Jackson, who saw that you could make a movie out of it, who wanted to make a, a who spent his life creating an entire studio system in New Zealand so that he could make The Hobbit and, and make Lord of the Rings. He would have preferred to make The Hobbit first, actually. Um, uh, I don't think there's a single frame in Lord of the Rings that I could better. I mean, I've seen some, I, I, obviously, I, I saw some of the footage uh, when it was being shot, but the way it was edited and put together, it's the matches. It, it, you, when you've got enough film, you can make lots of different films out of them, to be honest with you. Your choice as an editor would be different from your choice as an editor, or my choice as an editor. Uh, you know, actors would say, well, um, the cut that has me in it more prominently is probably the best cut. But the greatness of a director is to be able, we get back to the old thing again, to tell the story with what he's got and the way he wants to tell it. Jackson was a genius, is a genius, and uh, I wouldn't have changed a frame in the end. One more. Brilliant, so we got one more question there, here. So, um, did you take anything with you from the Lord of the Rings set, like a trinket or a piece of clothing or something else? I was given an axe. Every dwarf should have an axe or two and travel with it. But, you know, you can't get on a plane these days, you know, with an axe and sharp. They say, you might hurt somebody. They say, well, what do you think an axe is for? It is to hurt people, bad people. Ah, uh, but you might hurt the, the stewardess. We dwarves do not attack women, and we dwarves do not attack innocent people. We're there for orcs and orukai and bad things. And that's why if you have a dwarf on a plane with an axe, nothing bad will happen. Amazing. Amazing. Uh, I just had a question which went into my ear from uh, the creators of Comic Con to end on this. If you could return to one franchise as any character you played, so if they said we're going to follow on years later in that franchise, I know Indiana Jones 5, you're not going to say anything, but it's in the air. Is there any character you'd love to return to? I'd like to do two seasons more of a revitalized... say Sliders. Sliders. I, I drew up a proposal suggesting how it could be done, that we could get the original four back together, and, uh, and we would accumulate different characters in different situations. We could see the ones that looked like the audience would really bind to them and, 
uh, and, and, and grow with you. And then after a, a couple of seasons, we would start to lose some of the original characters. I wouldn't want to do it for long two years. Uh, and, uh, but the idea was that finally you'd leave Jerry there, essentially becoming the older Jerry and also a bit of the, the, the older, the middle-aged Maximilian Arturo. Uh, and, and he would be left there with a, a group of really photogenic, younger people who can really act and were interested. And they would do it then for eight or ten years and then stop it. Uh, and, and pick it up again perhaps 20 years later when those younger actors who have been brought into the show and have really developed were ready now in middle age to... to well, uh, yeah, it, would, it would make sense. Sliders is the biggest miss opportunity in science fiction on television. You can go anywhere in space and anywhere in time. The only limitation was the imagination of the writers. And, and the failure of imagination was not with the writers alone. It was with the studios who just didn't get what they had. They had a jewel there. They had Bitcoin at 50 cents. <laughs> um, and, uh, and they blew it. Um, but anyway, I'm sorry, the old, the old irritations come through. Hey, I liked it. Any, anything that starts the sliders, come back, Jane. I'm on board. Very good. Uh, may, I, may I just thank them? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, by the way, is there anybody else who's got another question? Very good. You're a wonderful... Oh, there's a microphone coming behind you. Yeah. I've seen that you have many different ties you wear. Is it? Is there any story behind them? Uh, yes. Well, no. There's not a story behind them. There is. I mean, just look around you. Look at the girls. They're all interestingly dressed. And the blokes. God, what a dreary lot we are. We're meant to be peacocks. And look at me, I'm wearing a bloody suit. It's the only opportunity men have for showing colour, really, is in things like ties. And nobody in France wears a tie anyway. That's why you're so intelligent. Wearing a tie actually reduces your blood flow to the brain by 7%. <laughs> which is why I think I'm in Oklahoma at the moment. <laughs> you um, are, John. You are. But, uh... But, but, um, so that's really the story. I, it's, it's my own private sort of attempt at being a peacock. And you should have fun ties, not just stripes for the club and things like that. Yesterday was Marilyn Monroe. Oh, gorgeous. Uh, the sad thing about it is that if you really want to be remembered, die young. That's the key to it all. Mm. But anyway, I actually met... I, I, I have a friend of mine whose daughter is 15, uh, who, who has actually fallen deeply in love with Kurt Cobain, uh, who, must, uh, who would probably be, what, 55 or 60 by now, if he'd been alive, but no, he died young and so romantically. <laughs> right. Anyway, I, I just want to thank you all for being, and you particularly, because you have been the most intelligent, wise, judicious, thinking member of the audience. Tell me your name, will you? Achibo. Very good. Well, there you are. See, this is the future of, of film and audience. And, uh, and the future of us all. Make babies, girls and boys, make babies. The smartest thing you will ever do in life. Take care. There you go. Oh, and you too. I oh. didn't see that. Emily. Emily. Another little girl. Very good. Love to you all. Bye. Joe Reese Davies, everyone. What a pleasure. What a pleasure. And me. 
this guy. <laughs> Take care. Thank you all. Bye. One more time, Jerissa. We will be back at 12 for the Star Wars panel. So please come back for that. Please see John. He's here all day. What a gen. Look at him go.